<laughs> Hello, how is everyone doing? Good? Okay. Uh, my name is Colleen. I am a outreach, oh, I'm actually a market manager now with the Princeton Review. I used to be an outreach specialist. I have been with the Princeton Review for six years. Uh, so I've been helping students ace graduate school tests, high school tests uh, for six years now. But Princeton Review has been around for about 40 plus years. So I come to you with that knowledge, also my knowledge. Um, a little background on me. I knew going into college, I wanted to help people. Uh, I knew I wanted to help others. That was my goal. So I went in as a nursing major. I was like, I can be a nurse. This is what I want to do. I got to my second nursing class and they're like, you're gonna practice IVs on each other. And I was like, I'm out. <laughs> yep, needles, me, blood, yeah, no. I don't know why I thought that was a good idea. Uh, so I switched to education um, and then I did two degrees. I did education and business. I thought I wanted to teach business, but then found Prince Review and kind of found a different path that led me here. Uh, so I get to give back to students every day. I love it. I am here as a resource for you, so please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have questions at any time. So, entrance exams. How many of you are thinking law school? Anybody? No law school, yeah? Okay, I'll I, I just wanna make sure I touch on all the tests if we need to. Anybody going to med school? Wanna be a doctor? Okay, a couple. How about an MBA or like a specialty business program? Okay, and then any other graduate program? Jerry, any dental or optometry? Perfect, I won't touch on either of those. So we'll talk about all of the different tests. So the LSAT is for law school, the MCAT is for med school, the GMAT is for MBAs or business school, the GRE is for any other grad school, it encompasses everything else, and then the two next to MCAT are DAT, which is for dental school, and OAT, which are for optometry school. They are less familiar, they're just, they're still there. So the thing that we hear every day is what about test optional, right? Schools have got adopted this test optional policy and what does that mean? It just means that the tests aren't required for admissions. But test optional doesn't mean test blind or test free. It doesn't mean that they're not looking at them if you submit them. They can still help you get in and make you more competitive. We've talked about grad school, it's, you know, and trying to get the most money you can for it. Schools want to give money to more competitive applicants, right? And how do you make yourself more competitive? You have a good LSAT, MCAT, GRE, GMAT score. The two tests that will not be optional, at least for right now, are LSAT and MCAT. So LSAT is governed by LSAC, the Law School Admissions Council, and the ABA, which is the American Bar Association. The ABA, who is pretty much the like, God of law schools has said, yeah, you're gonna take the LSAT. You wanna go to law school, you're gonna take, take test. And if you think the LSAT is hard, you don't wanna take the bar one day, I promise you it's even harder, so take the LSAT as like a walk in the park. The MCAT is also governed by AAMC. They also have said the MCAT is not optional. Now the GMAT and GRE might be optional depending on the schools, I encourage you to take them if you have the opportunity to do so. You can get a fee waiver, et cetera, because it's going to help your application. So we'll talk about the LSAT first. So what is the LSAT? It's the Law School Admissions Test. Pretty basic. Um, it's run by the Law School Admissions Council, LSAC. Uh, I've noticed that LSAC, they, and like the law school in general, they love acronyms. It's, it's like their favorite thing to do. So there's lots of acronyms with law school. Um, it's accepted by all ABA, again, another acronym, which is American Bar Association Accredited Schools. If you want to be a lawyer, you want to go to an ABA accredited school. Why? Because that's the only way you can take the bar unless you live in California. California, which is the largest bar association, they make up their own rules over there and they say if you, did, you went to a California accredited school or an unaccredited school, you could still practice law in the state of California, but nowhere else. So my recommendation, if you're considering law school, go to an ABA accredited school. It's just the safest route. They say that the LSAT is predictive of student performance in their first year of law school, as well as future bar passage rate. Schools care about their bar passage rate because it's how they become accredited and they stay accredited. A law school's average over three years, if 70% of students don't pass the bar on like a three-year average, 
then they lose that accreditation. And schools don't wanna lose accreditation because then they're basically becoming a relevant law school and they go out of business. So they wanna accept students who are going to pass the bar. So what does LSAT testing look like? So LSAT, unlike GRE and GMAT, which we'll talk about, LSAT is on specific dates and specific months. So in 2023, 2024 testing cycle, August, September, October, November, January, February, April, and June. Almost every month, but not every month. There is also only two days each month that you can take it and they fall back to back. Friday, Saturdays are typical. Uh, the LSAC al allows for three testing dates in a year, five testing dates in five years, and seven, seven test dates in a lifetime. So the LSAT isn't a test to take over and over and over. It's a test you're designed to take once, get the highest score possible, and go from there. However, if you are considering, and I will say this for any test type, graduate education, you should take the test now. Now I'm not saying like right in this very moment or even tomorrow, but like when you're still in the habit of studying and taking tests, these standardized admissions tests are so much easier. And scores are typically good, like LSAT scores are good for five years, GRE scores are good for five years. Take them now, even if you wanna take a couple gap years. I get it, right? No problem, but take the test now, then you have that score ready to go when you're ready to go to grad school. The LSAT is not testing how much you know about the law, right? It's testing your ability to think like a lawyer, right? You don't need to know anything about the law. You don't need to know about any cases. You don't need to know about any of that type of stuff, right? You just, can you think like a lawyer thinks? So this is what the LSAT looks like. There's a reading comprehension, an argument section, a game section, and then an unscored variable, which is just a repeat of one of the three sections. It's just an experimental section they're using to basically test future questions for exams. Most um, tests have an experimental section. The LSAT is no different. The LSAT does have an essay that is unscored. It is just a writing sample, but you do have to take it. It gets sent to all law schools that you apply to with your LSAT score. It basically shows law schools that I can write because in law school, you do a, a lot of two different things, reading and writing. That's basically what you do in three years of law school. So this is what an analytical writing example looks like, or analytical reasoning, excuse me, this is like a game. I will not make you do this game um, because I don't wanna put you, your brain through that much. But this is what a game looks like, right? It's basically something that's gonna give you a bunch of different categories or things, and you have to map it out, right? So this is talking about recycling centers. This is what they recycle. Here's the rules that apply to this game. So then you map out the game, right? And then once you have the game mapped out, then it's gonna ask you questions about the game, right? So which one of the following could be an accurate account of the kinds of materials recycled in each uh, center in Rivertown? So we popped our rules back up. Normally I'll go through this for time's sake. Today I won't make you go through this. And you'll figure out that B is the correct answer and you've mapped out your game. With the LSAT, this is probably the most challenging section because it's testing so many different abilities. It's testing your time management. The test is designed to make you run out of time. All of them are. That's, that's what they want you to do. They want you to be in a hurry. Those are the traps they want you to fall into. So it's not only testing that time management so you don't spend too long mapping out a game, but then how quickly can you figure out that game? Logical reasoning, which is just an arguments type of section, this is what that would look like. It's basically, which one of the following is true would most seriously weaken the argument. Again, I'm not gonna make you all go through all these games, but I pop them up so you can see what questions look like. If you have questions, I can always talk about them. The next test, which is the biggest beast, for those of you interested in med school, it is the biggest hurdle to jump through. It is a seven and a half hour long test. It is the longest of the admissions tests. You are there all day, but it is one of the easier tests to study for. It's not an easy test, but easier because it's specifically tied to your background of science. 
right? So if you have the science knowledge, sometimes the MCAT is a little bit easier. So it's the meds, or Medical College Admissions Test, or MCAT. It's administered by AAMC, or the American Association of Medical Colleges. They're like that governing board, again, of med schools. It is required for every med school in the US and Canada. MD, DO programs, it doesn't matter. It is required at every single medical school. Because they are governed by AAMC, they have to follow that rule. So unfortunately for med school students, it is not a test optional policy. However, it is a helpful tool. If you can get a good score, it will make the difference of you getting in and not getting in. MCAT test dates, it's again one of those ones on select test dates. For the MCAT, you can only register for one date at a time. So you can't register for like three test dates. You, they only want you to register one at a time. The MCAT is also the most expensive test at $310. The other ones are between $200 and $250. Um, the MCAT is the most expensive at $310. I think it's just because they like keep you hostage all day. So they got <laughs> it's a lot of air conditioning, right? Uh, they also have registration zones, so it can be a little bit cheaper depending on when you register. There are prerequisites before you can take the MCAT, unlike any other test. So LSAT, GMAT, GRE, it does not matter what your background was in, you can take any of the tests, you can go to law school, you can go to grad school, you can go to business school. The, LSA, or the MCAT, however, does have some prerequisites. You have to take a full year of biology, so two semesters or three quarters, depending on what system you're on. The same for physics, general chemistry, and organic chemistry. Um, then you also have to take a semester of bio, biochemistry, psychology, and sociology. So the MCAT is very science heavy, which makes sense for medical students. Uh, but you have to take these before you can take the MCAT. That's like AMC saying, these are what's going to make you successful. You have to at least have this much science knowledge before taking the MCAT. The MCAT is, or med school is the hardest grad school to get into. So if you're not considering med school, probably pretty easy compared to this. Last year, there were 906, 588,000 medical school applications. That's 53,030 applicants. How many students do you think got into med school last year? Shout out some numbers. What do you guys think? 10, okay, five. A hundred, okay. <laughs> you guys were you guys were a little bit off. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. Twenty-two thousand two hundred and thirty-nine matriculants. <laughs> However, that's less than half the students that apply. Right, so that's half the people putting in all of this time and money and effort applying to med school don't even get accepted. I don't want that to be you. I want you to follow fall in this little triangle at the bottom. Right, I want you to get in. So I want you to have all of the tools necessary. If you wanna be a doctor, I wanna help you become a doctor. Doctor of medicine. If you wanna become another doctor, you can get there. But doctor of medicine specifically for this, I wanna help you get there. This is what the MCAT scoring looks like in the MCAT sections. So we talked about science knowledge, but you don't see like a biology section up there. No, instead you see chemical and physical foundations of biological systems. Why do they do that? Because it's not just testing biology, but how biology mixes with chemistry and biochemistry and all of these other sciences. So all of the science sections up there mix different sciences together. So you can't just have a base level knowledge of biology, but how does biology and chemistry mix together? You also, and it's probably the most challenging section for MCAT students is the CARS section. It's the critical analysis and reasoning skills. Most students that take the MCAT um, our science math brain, like that's, that's their strong area, right? The CARS is a reading comprehension section, which makes it much harder. So MCAT score percentiles. Most students, uh, about 85% of students who get accepted to med school fall in this category that I have highlighted on the side, a 510 or higher. That's the 82nd percentile you have to be in of MCAT scores to get into med school. It is tough to get into med school, but your MCAT score can help you because 85% of students who fall in that category get into med school. 
The MCAT can make or break your opportunities getting into med school, but it can also get you a lot of money for med school as well. So we talked about the sections. This is what your testing day looks like. You'll see in the morning, you have a tutorial, Jace basically walks you through the section or how to use all the different resources. Then you have a 95 minute section and a 10 minute break, a 90 minute section and then the 30 minute break, a 95 minute section and then a 10 minute break, and then another 95 minute section. It is a long day. And their students, do you see how those breaks say optional? They're not optional. But no, like you are, please do not, it's like you're taking the MCAT, please take a break. I've had students that are like, but I can get through the test in, you know, an hour shorter. Okay, yeah, your brain though, and those last two sections is going to be fried. <laughs> like you are going to be fried and begging someone to go back to that 30 minute break. I promise you. So don't take, I know they say optional, just like cross that out in your brain because those breaks help you. Food, water, bathroom, a deep breath of fresh air because half the time you're not really breathing when you're going through the section so quickly. This is an example M, um, MCAT question. I uh, will not begin to walk you through this question because I do not teach the MCAT. <laughs> I do not know the first thing. Like I am like math reading brain. I'm like a little bit of mixed science, not my strong suit. So like I won't try to walk you through this, but I put this up there so you know what it looks like. The other things that they talk about are small things like irritable bowel syndrome. For, science, for those of you that have been in a science class, you probably talked about this maybe once, maybe. So they're asking about these like minute things in there that you've talked about maybe once in your science classes. That's why doing things like practice tests before any of the exams helps you so you know what types of questions you're going to see on test day. This is a timeline. So med school's application is different than most med school or most other graduate school applications. It's a full year cycle. So the applications typically open in June, end of May, beginning of June. And then it's basically a full year. They get their acceptances like the next spring, basically. So they go through initial applications, secondary applications, interviews, and then they start getting acceptances. So it's just a little bit longer of a timeline um, and I can also send these slides if like anybody wants them, it's no problem. So the GMAT, for my business people, let's talk about the GMAT. Now, this information that I am telling you will be relevant for about the next nine months. But GMAT just said that they are changing the GMAT test. So nine months, they said before the end of the year, I say about nine-ish months if that's the end of the year. I assume it'll probably come towards the later half of the year because they just announced it. So they're changing the GMAT to be a little bit more business focused, but right now it's not super business focused. So this, just take that with a grain of salt, depending on when you're going to take your GMAT, this information might change. It's created by business schools for business schools, right? The GMAT exam is the most trusted, proven, and well understood predictor of academic success is what they have said. That's by the Graduate Management Admissions Council. Well, I'm here to tell you, I am not sure how the current GMAT predicts your academic success because all standardized tests say is how well you do on this one specific test. But they, these people say these things and we then pass on along the information to you. But my job is to tell you, it is one test. The rest of your application matters, right? Students get so caught up with, I can't get a good score. I'm not, it's fine. Right, like I'm here to help you try and get the best score possible, but it is just one part of your application, especially with the GMAT. Again, you should take the GMAT now. Why? Because while well, you're still in the habit of studying and taking tests, it's best to do it now. It is a computer-based test. It is offered at testing centers year round. Most testing centers are open Monday through Thursday. However, Thank you to COVID. You can now take it at home 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you were like, I'm gonna test at 10 o'clock tomorrow night, you can absolutely do that. I don't know if I would be testing at 10 o'clock at night or two o'clock in the morning 
but it's offered 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You only have to sign up 24 hours in advance. However, there are some things with testing at home. You have to be able to have a webcam and a microphone so they can see and hear you the entire time. Also, if there's like, if you live in a noisy environment, you have roommates that you know are gonna be walking by, you might wanna still go to a testing center and you have the opportunity to do so. It's just not as flexible as taking it at home. The GMAT tests the skills that you're going to use in business school. So what's on the GMAT? Well, first, what is not on the GMAT? Excuse me. Uh, business strategies, economics, entrepreneurship, organizational structures, management, finance, and marketing. And you're like, some of you are probably looking at me like, okay, so what is on the GMAT? Mm -hmm. Critical reasoning, mm -hmm. argument evaluation, data interpretation, reading comprehension, analytical writing, graphic interpretation, and logical reasoning. They're the skills you need to have, not the knowledge you need to have. There's two different things, right? The business knowledge is definitely going to help you, right? Having an undergrad business degree will definitely help you with an advanced business degree. But it's more, the GMAT focuses more on the skills that make you successful. It is a computer adaptive test, and most students have never taken a computer adaptive test. So for the GMAT, what does that mean? It means each question is adaptive on the other. So it can be mapped out like this. First question you get is hard. If you get, or first question you get is medium. If you get it right, the next question will be harder. If you get it wrong, the next question is easier. If you get the hard question right, it gets harder. If you get the easy question right, it gets easier. And it can be mapped out different ways, right? Like you get the easy question right, it goes back to medium. You get the hard question wrong, it goes down to medium. So what does this mean? Unlike other multiple choice tests and all of the other standardized exams, you cannot skip around within a section. You have to answer each question on the GMAT to move on to the next one. With every standardized test, every test I'm talking about today though, you are not marked down for wrong answers. So whether you leave a question blank or guess wrong, it's weighted the same. So what's everyone going to at least try to do? Yes. You have a one in four, one in five, right? There's like a percentage chance you can get it correct. Always, always, always guess. Never leave anything blank. So what does the GMAT look like? So you're gonna have a quantitative, which is your math section. You're going to have verbal, which is like your reading comprehension, your grammar, your vocab section. Integrated reasoning, I say it's similar to a math section, just a little bit more advanced with uh, graphics and charts and tables, et cetera. And then you'll have an analytical writing assessment, which is your essay. With this essay, it's the analysis of an argument. What does that mean? Don't give your opinion. They don't want your opinion. They want you to analyze the argument and talk about ways in which it can be made better. Whether you agree with the argument or not, there was like what, I don't know, three years ago, there was one about bread. And like if a company started selling a new type of bread, they were gonna be super successful. Whether you agreed with that argument or not, they didn't care. They want you to analyze that argument and give examples in which ways it can be made stronger. GMAT scoring, so you get zero to 60 on each section, the quantitative and verbal one point increments. Um, Integrated reasoning is one to eight and one point increments, and then analytical writing assessment is zero to six and half point increments. The thing to remember about the essay, they're graded two times, once by a computer system, once by a, a human grader. The two scores are averaged together and that's how you get your score. If the human grader and the computer grade are like way off, I think it's more than two points difference, then they'll throw out the computer graded score, have a second human read it, and then you'll get an average of those two scores. It does not spell check for you. It does not grammar check for you. So make sure you give yourself time to review those things. The GMAT total score is a score of 200 to 800. Now I always get asked, what is a good score? It really does depend on the school you're applying to. And a lot of people have said that, right? Know the schools you're applying to. What is the median score of typically accepted students? For some schools, it might be a 500. For top 10 business schools, it's closer to a 700 or higher. 
right? So it depends on the school you're applying to. I, like I always, I always hate answering like, what's a good score? A good score is one that gets you into your top choice school. So if that's a 500 for one of you and a 750 for another, totally understandable. Percentile wise though, of like what is about average, median is about a 564.8. That's a, about average of a median score. Again, median is tough because you have all the outliers, but that's about average. A 700 puts you in the 88th percentile, a 500 puts you in the 25th percentile. So again though, depending on the school you're applying to, focus on that score, that's a good score for you. Section percentiles I won't worry about. Here's an example question. Again, just it'll talk to you about, you know, which of the following best expressions and assumption made in the argument above. You go through. Typically when we have more time, I'll do practice problems, but for today, just so you guys can kind of see what problems look like on the GMAT. This is an integrated reasoning. This is the one I typically get the most questions about. So on the GMAT, you cannot use a calculator on the quantitative section. However, on the integrated reasoning section, you get this very fancy calculator. Oh, it's not gonna pop up, it's not in this one. It's like a little four function calculator. If any of you have smartphones, you know like the basic calculator that's on your phone, that's about as fancy as you get. But it does help with some of the math to make it a little bit easier. You're not having to do it all on scratch paper. So integrated reasoning will look like this. It might be true or false questions. It might not, but it will look, it'll have some sort of graph, chart, et cetera and then ask things about that graph or chart. Most of the time it's math related. So the last test that most of you probably wanna know about is the GRE. What kinds of programs accept the GRE? The better question is what kind don't accept the GRE for the most part? Life sciences, physical sciences, engineering, social and behavior sciences, humanities, arts, education, business, other fields. Pretty much anything that wasn't covered by one of the other tests is covered by the GRE. So what does that say about the GRE? Well, it has to be a pretty general test, right? It's not gonna test you anything about the actual area you're going into, but it's a more general knowledge type of test. It is required by most graduate programs, even if it's test optional, right? There is now this caveat of it is also accepted by some business and some law schools. So if you're thinking, maybe I wanna to go to this grad program, they might also wanna to go to law school, you can take the GRE as like a one test fits all for a small number of law schools. It's about 43 law schools that accept the GRE. And that number is also growing. Um, Law schools tried to go back to the ABA and become test optional this year. It actually just happened about two months ago. Um, and the ABA board said, mm, no, that's not gonna happen. So what school said was, okay, well, we'll start accepting the GRE as well as the LSAT. So that was kind of the compromise, I guess, was ABA said you have to require a test for admissions, but they didn't specify that it had to be LSAT. So more and more law schools are starting to accept the GRE as well. It is easy to take the GRE, easy. Now I'm not saying it's an easy test, I'm saying it's easy to take it. You can also take it 24 hours a day, seven days a week at home. Easy, right? Like I could leave today, what time is it? It is 2.10-ish, 3.10-ish, 3.10-ish. Um, and I could sign up for a test at four o'clock tomorrow. Take it at home pop up my little computer and take the GRE. Easy to take it, right? It's not an easy test, but it's easy to take it. So that shouldn't be a barrier. You don't even have to like leave your house. You don't have to put on pants if you don't want to. Like whatever you're comfortable in, you can take the GRE at home. The best time to take the GRE is right now. You can take it up to five times in a 12 month period. Now that's a rolling calendar. It's not a, like a January through December calendar, it is a rolling calendar. So if you take it back to back to back to back to back to back to back, you're gonna be waiting basically a year until you can take it again. Scores are good for five years. It's okay to take a gap year. I know a lot of people that finished undergrad and took a gap year. 
right? It's okay, but you should still take your jury now. Jury sections are very similar to GMAT sections. You'll have two essays, one you give your opinion, one you don't. Uh, quantitative reasoning, which is math, verbal reasoning, which is grammar, um, reading comprehension. The jury is very, 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 very vocab heavy. Lots of vocab words tested. And then an experimental section, it will either be a verbal or a quantitative section. It's again, an unscored variable. They just want to test what future like exam questions will look like. So your analytical writing assessment, you have two essays, analysis of an issue and analysis of an argument. Analysis of an issue, remember if there is an issue, you're going to give your opinion. If it's an argument, we're not gonna argue and we're not gonna give our opinion. That's the easiest way I remember is like, don't argue, right? So no opinion on the argument section. On the issue, you can give your opinion. Quantitative is going to be your math section. Both with the GMAT and GRE, this test is testing stuff you probably haven't even thought about since early college, maybe even high school, depending on when you took some of these maths. That's why kind of doing some practice tests and studying for it a little bit is important because you probably haven't thought about this stuff in three, four, five, six plus years. You do get this fancy little calculator. This is the same one that's on the GMAT. Really is a nice calculator. I mean, well, yeah. <laughs> but it's basic, right? But it is helpful. Mm -hmm. Verbal reasoning is going to be your vocab, reading comprehension, analysis, pretty basic to the point. It is also a computer adaptive test. However, unlike the GMAT, it is not adaptive by question, it's adaptive by section. So your first section of verbal and your first section of quantitative are gonna be medium level difficulty. If you do well, the next section is hard. You do okay, medium, do poorly, low. Why does this matter? So your first section, right, is going to boost your score. So the top score is a 170. So say we get to a 170. Even if you do pretty bad on that mostly hard section, it's not gonna drop your score that much. However, if you go to that easy section, it's much harder to jump your score to where you want to be. You have to get almost every question correct. So that first section of verbal and that first section of quantitative matter just a, a slight more than that second section. Now, both are obviously important. It just that it's kind of setting like the um, base rate or whatever for your score. A text completion question. So this is a vocab question. I always tell students about these questions. You'll see there's two blanks. Sometimes they'll have three. In order to get the point for this question, you have to get both blanks correct. There's no partial credit given. So it makes it a little bit more difficult. I won't, again, make you go through the question. This is another type of vocab question. When I said it was vocab heavy, it's very vocab heavy. You'll have one blank on sentence equivalence questions and there's always going to be two correct answers. Not one, not three, not five, two. So you could do process of elimination, get yourself to the correct answers. Now it's not like common vocab words, right? Like most of these words you probably don't use on a daily basis or your monthly, yearly basis. So that's why studying GRE vocab is important. My favorite four letter word is free. There are lots of free resources out there you go onto the app store, type in GRE vocab flashcard, that's gonna give you a lot of free options. It's the best way to study. Quantitative comparison. This is asking you, is quantity A greater? Is quantity B greater? Are they equal? Can they not be determined? So you could plug in a number, see that quantity B is greater, plug in another number, see that they're actually equal, so the relationship cannot be determined from the information given. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> So there'll be lots of quantitative comparisons. The thing with these is don't try to make them super complex, right? Try and make any, any standardized test question as easy as possible. Now, the thing about the GRE math section is there are some fill in the blanks. So you're going through a multiple choice question, then you come along and there's no longer multiple choice answers. And everybody's first reaction is to panic. Don't panic, right? They're not super difficult. You know, you can make it like this one, where if you remember your special right triangles, you would know the missing side is eight, six, 10. You could also use um, 
a squared plus b squared equals c squared. But if you remember your special right triangles, these numeric entry questions are pretty easy. Now, some common misconceptions about these standardized tests. Does these tests measure intelligence? True or false? False. They test how well you do on this one specific test. Do they reflect your GPA? False. The best score always wins in the admissions process. False. You could have a perfect score on any of the admissions tests, but if the rest of your application sucks, you're still not getting in. It's gonna help, right? It might help pad some of those other things, but it's not the only thing that matters. Test scores are important and can be used to award aid. That is true, yes. And do these tests test what you've learned in college? That was kind of a trick question. Yes, sometimes, yes. On one hand, yes. On the other hand, no. College transcripts, obviously also important. Statement of purpose, I won't talk about. All of this stuff goes into that application though. So these tests want to trick you and they know how to trick you because we as the human race are pretty predictable. So we're gonna do a little bit of a game. Is everyone ready? What color is this board? White. What color is the board? White. What color is this piece of paper? White. What color is this piece of paper? White. What do cows drink? Water. Water. How many of you said milk though? I heard some milk. Yes, that's what they do on the test. It's okay, I do that on purpose. Cows drink water, cows produce milk. These tests are trying to trick you and they will do things like that over and over and over again because they know what trap you're gonna fall into. We are predictable people, right? That's what these tests are designed to do. There are highly paid people that write standardized tests. And when I say highly paid, like, if I got offered their, yeah, yeah I'd go take their job, right? You want me to, yeah, trick, yeah, I'll, do, I'll write all the tricks for you. But that's their job, right? Write questions that are tricky that have those traps we're gonna fall into. So there's lots of ways to prep. You can take a class, you can buy a book, self-prep online, you can work with the tutor. I am here to help you. If you were just to go to our website, it looks like things cost money. They do. But the benefit of coming to things like this, you could always reach out to me. I have scholarships to give away all the time. And most of the time I have ones that go unused each year because no one reaches out to me. I am here to help you. I am a resource. If you want a GRE prep course or a GMAT or an MCAT or a whatever test prep course, just tell me. Don't scan this QR code because it doesn't it doesn't work. I, we had some technical difficulties, so this is the old QR code, so don't scan this one. But there are lots of free resources out there. Free. Like in, in today's economy, free? I'll take anything free. Like someone says free, count me and I'll be there. Right? Free is the best four-letter word out there. There are lots of free resources. You just have to find them. They're not going to fall on your lap. Right? They're not going to magically fall from the sky. You just have to find them. You can get into the graduate school you want. I absolutely believe in you. Everyone here believes in you. Right? We all know that you can get into the graduate school you want. You just have to take the first step. Right? It's like a child. Right? You want them to walk, but you cannot walk for them. They have to walk on their own. You can help them, and we want to help you, but you have to be willing to take that first step. Okay, thank you guys.